evening. Thanks for coming. Uh, I want to remind everybody to please silence their cell phones. We're very glad that you've all been able to come tonight, the Hudson Library. We really love bringing you these Distinguished Speakers series. And in that, uh, because of that, I want to mention, as always, that we do have a donation box on the wall by the entranceway into the room uh, if you care to contribute so that we can continue offering these wonderful programs. Tonight we have not just one, but two distinguished speakers. Um, and we're here to commemorate the anniversary of the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. The library was looking for a significant way to honor this event, and I think we came up with a home run. We've heard, uh, you may have heard of Howard Willens, the author of um, <laughs> History Will Prove Us Right, inside the Warren Commission report on the assassination of John F. Kennedy. Mr. Willens was a member of the Warren Commission staff during the investigation. He's written a book about it. He's been on television and NPR lately. You must have heard of him. He's, we're very happy that he's agreed to come here. He's going to be speaking at the City Club tomorrow, and the next day he's going to be at Cleveland State University. Interviewing Mr. Willens is our other distinguished guest, David Malpas of WCPN in Cleveland. Mr. Malpas came to IdeaStream in 2006 after a lengthy career in NPR. The Learned Owl Bookshop in Hudson is here tonight with copies of the book for sale. And after the program, we're going to have a reception in the library rotunda, and we all welcome you all to come there and get some refreshments and have your book signed. Uh, they have some for sale now, and they'll also be selling some afterwards in the rotunda. So without any further ado, let's welcome our guests. Very comfortable. Thank you. Thank you uh, for being here with us and uh, engaging in this discussion. I, uh, well, it's a good crowd, and I'm not surprised because I think there's a lot of interest still, of course, this being the 50th anniversary of President Kennedy's death, and there uh, have been a lot of things people have been watching and reading and listening to about that. Uh, I'm glad we have a few days from that anniversary, though, to have absorbed it a little bit before engaging in another conversation about it. There seems to have been so many conversations, so much written, uh, what is there left to say? But we have a, a unique perspective in this book and this author, having someone who was there in the Warren Commission and um, very engaged in helping to lead that investigation, being a key part of it. His um, conversation tonight will be able to tell us about what was going on, what, what uh, staff members were thinking and looking at, how they worked, and uh, why he thinks the Warren Commission got it right. We will, um, I will ask some questions first, and then we'll open it up to questions from you, and I'll leave plenty of time for that. I want to ask a few sort of big picture questions of, of uh, what we've learned from this whole experience in terms of the national long, uh, seemingly endless conversation about the assassination and who was responsible and conspiracy theories. Uh, but I also want to ask about uh, some loose threads that uh, some people think are still worth investigating or talking more about. Uh, I don't want to start, though, with the personal impact that this has had on your life of being part of this investigation at the time, and uh, as well as being living through the aftermath of uh, the Warren Commission's report and the many uh, attacks that the Commission report received over the years. Sort of walk us through a bit of the impact on your life personally and the, the good and bad of that. 
Well, th thank you, David, and I'd like to uh, extend my thanks to uh, Alan Smith and the staff of this wonderful uh, library. It is a great institution with a wonderful tradition of servicing the public, and I'm honored uh, to be part of, of, of its program. Uh, people continually ask uh, whether I have been uh, affected uh, adversely or otherwise by this uh, traumatic experience of working for nine months on the Warren Commission staff, um, beginning in December of 1963 and extending through September of 64, when the commission delivered its report uh, to the president. And somewhere out in the lobby, I saw a picture of, of that event uh, uh, at which I was not present. Uh, uh, but uh, I recall the report that the President Johnson's first comment on receiving the report from Chief Justice Warren was that it's very heavy. Uh, I don't think that President Johnson spent much time reading it, uh, frankly, uh, but I'm sure one or more members of his staff did. Uh, it was the most intense professional experience of my career. I've been very fortunate to have a variety of assignments over the years that have been challenging and novel, demanding, funny, serious, uh, and et cetera. Uh, but certainly the Warren Commission uh, was unique in terms of its national and international importance. And I know that my assessment is shared by my colleagues <laughs> from all over the country, uh, and there are about half of the staff still remaining alive and, and well, and some of us have gotten together to exchange uh, reminiscences and, and talk at some of the uh, events during the past few months. I commend you all for your tolerance and good humor in showing up for yet another discussion uh, after being besieged uh, for two months with uh, TV programs, some of which were not worth very much. Uh, others that were valuable contributions and a variety of books, of which very few were worth anything uh, whatsoever. And I hope that m mine is different in terms of its, uh, uh, but that remains for you to determine and not, not for me. Uh, I'd say that uh, uh, many of us uh, had mixed uh, uh, experiences after the report came out. And the basic question was, do we try to respond individually or do we try to uh, organize some kind of a, a, a co coherent uh, group response to the criticisms that emerged within months, if not weeks, of the issuance of our report? But some of us uh, recognized that the Chief Justice wanted us to treat the book as he treats his opinions. Namely, the justices deliberate, they write an opinion, and that's it. And no one elaborates on it, responds to questions about it. You say, read the opinion. So that was the view of the Chief Justice, and there were some members of the staff, including the uh, general counsel, J. Lee Rankin, who was a former Solicitor General of the United States in the Eisenhower years, and, and Norman Redlich, who became Dean of the NYU Law School, a close friend of mine, uh, who adopted the Chief Justice's uh, uh, admonition uh, for the rest of their lives. Others on the staff, including Ireland Specter, who was a classmate of mine, from law school uh, was elected to public office within a year or two after the commission report was issued. And he was besieged uh, uh, with reporters. And he was an elected official. He felt, felt that I can't possibly refuse to answer questions as an elected official. So he began to respond to uh, uh, criticisms. Uh, uh, one other uh, colleague of mine uh, who practiced law in, in, in Iowa was so upset by the uh, uh, criticism, and, and I think so bored with his legal practice, uh, uh, that he decided to write a book in 1973 that tried to identify the way in which the commission worked, how it evaluated uh, competing testimony, and why the commission reached the judgment it did on particular issues, such as, well, some people heard two shots, some heard six shots, some people heard three, four, and five shots. How did the commission conclude there were only three shots? So. Uh, so some people responded aggressively in that way. A couple of my colleagues uh, were invited to go over to uh, London to uh, 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 perform, so to speak, on a BBC uh, uh, exploration of the commission's results. And, and after a while, I decided that, uh, when I was busy with my practice, that taking time out to respond uh, or not responding wasn't working very well because by the late 60s, the population, uh, or 70 percent of it, disbelieved the commission's principal findings. So I decided to try a little effort to rebut that and improve the, uh, the percentage of approval. So I participated in a few TV programs with one of the 
committed conspiracy theorist, a thorough investigator who had spent the last six years studying the 3,000 exhibits of the Warren Commission's report, absorbing uh, transcripts. And uh, when I was on a TV program with him, uh, uh, he was interested in asking me about exhibit 332. And I didn't remember exhibit 332, or in fact, hardly any of the 3,000 exhibits. I was trying to earn a living and support a large family. Um, so I found that my effort to direct people to the facts supporting the commission's findings were more futile than successful. So I decided to uh, abandon that approach until uh, uh, a few years ago when I decided that the time had come to uh, uh, tell the story uh, that I felt that only I could tell, uh, uh, in part because I was a survivor. And as you know, history gets written uh, by the survivors. Uh, of, of the battle. Uh, and so I happen to have kept uh, files of documents uh, from the commission work. Uh, lawyers are pack rats uh, by habit. Uh, for every case they adopt, uh, they have a file, a chronological file, and they have a document file, and they put everything in the one or the other. And sometimes their secretary doesn't know exactly why they put them in one file or the other. In any event, the general counsel of the uh, Commission had decided in the very first week of January, after he and I had worked together for about 10 days or so, that he wanted me to sort of serve to be his unofficial executive officer or a general bureaucrat. And he told his secretaries to send me a copy of every document that went out of his office. So I acquired all the investigative requests, all the communications with Congress, all the uh, public relations releases, and all those materials. And in addition, I was encouraged by a historian that was the Chief Justice brought on board uh, to uh, 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 write a, a journal. I have never written a diary or journal before this experience. I've never written one afterwards. As I say, it is turgid. It is bureaucratic. It's full of typos. Uh, it may not make sense to a contemporary uh, uh, audience. Uh, my, one of my grandsons asked his father, why does grandpa always refer to everyone as Mr? And uh, he didn't understand that uh, one used uh, uh, appellations like Mr. and Mrs. in those days as a matter of, of formality and, and, and speech. Uh, I don't think it's changed that grandson's a manner of speeching, uh, speak, speech. Uh, in any event, I had these raw materials, and I decided, and I am going to give them all to the National Archives, that it was time to tell this story. And that's why I wrote the book. And I think that the oh, in more direct response to the question, I, I think that uh, we ex go through these experiences, we treasure them, we want to revisit them occasionally, but one has to live one's life and uh, face other experiences. And, uh, but I think if I can provide an educational function here and a contribution to the historical record, that that will enrich uh, uh, my, my life and my, my experience in a way I think may be important. This up? Best one to over a little. How's that? 61% of Americans still believe in some type of conspiracy connected with this assassination, um, disagreeing with the Warren Commission, which is actually the lowest level that's been at since the late 1960s. What do you think accounts for this lingering um, doubt? And despite all the investigations and work, uh, the theories that have been put out there, and a lot of uh, evidence to dispute them. I think the one factor that uh, uh, has great, great significance is the fact that uh, Oswald was shot by Jack Ruby. I think uh, with his demise, uh, that meant there would be no public trial. Uh, there would be no evidence uh, developed with respect to the circumstances of his being employed, of his bringing the rifle into the building, of his appearance in, uh, in the sixth floor window of the depository, uh, and in the fact that uh, uh, fellow employees were on the fifth floor underneath uh, his little nest, and they heard the cartridges fall and dust fell from the ceiling above them. I think if we had Oswald uh, as a defendant, and it would have been in the state courts of Texas, because there was no federal law that made the killing of the president a crime at that time, if you believe that or not. Uh, it's incredible. 
Uh, and so in the absence of a trial, we not only lose an effort to elicit the facts about the event and any potential uh, uh, conspirators, but also we learn more about Oswald. And because one of the great failures of everyone who's taken a serious look at this is to identify one or even two predominant motives that prompted this ineffectual, confused uh, uh, man full of hatred uh, to killing the President of the United States. So I think the absence of a trial is a major contributor uh, 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 to the uh, high level of disbelief because the fact-finding efforts of a presidential commission and this is a second reason, are inevitably subject to the growing distrust of, of public records and, and, and public statements. And although I try to emphasize the fact that not only were the seven members of the commission themselves were very prestigious people with distinguished reputations and had no motive other than to find the truth, the more important point in my opinion is that most of the staff, with my exception, were from the private sector. And this was an extraordinary group uh, of, of lawyers and uh, some historians who had taken on this temporary assignment with no interest except finding the truth. And indeed, among the younger lawyers, there was particular enthusiasm about finding a conspiracy because you would thereby prove that the CIA and the FBI and the Secret Service didn't know what they were doing. So, you know, young lawyers are like that. Uh, some older lawyers, too. So. Uh, uh, there was a motivation of the staff to find out the truth, uh, but the distrust of public records uh, uh, and offic official statements has grown over the years. In the decade of the 60s, as many in this room remember, was a time not only of one assassination, but three or four of significance, of civil strife, of racial conflict, of ur urban difficulties, uh, and it was a uh, and Vietnam War controversy, all of which produced uh, into the 70s and later a sentiment that basically the government is not to be trusted. And I think that the Warren Commission uh, suffers to a considerable extent from that uh, 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 history. Uh, and I think that that contributes to the desire uh, for to find some alternative explanation. And lastly, I think there is this human desire uh, to, to find some, some motive or conspiracy here that, that uh, provides the whole event with some, some more significance uh, than it has if you have a single uh, uh, disgruntled individual killing the president uh, of the United States, the leader of the free world. There is this lust for equivalence. And we, we have to have some, you know, a, a major force uh, under, uh, underlying this assassination. It's as though people would be pleased if they found out it was the Soviet Union or Cuba. At least that would answer the need for some motive and some uh, I provide this with some dimension of importance that otherwise it, it appears to some to lack. I don't buy into that, obviously. But I think those are some of the reasons why the conspiracy theorists uh, are still flourishing. I'm pleased that it's 61 degree. I heard 61 percent. I heard a week or so ago it was down to 59. And I said, good, we're in the right direction. And maybe tonight we'll move it one more, one more degree. So let's work on that. Well, let me take the FBI first. Uh, uh, one thing should be emphasized here is that uh, contrary to one of the prevailing misconceptions about the Warren Commission is that it relied exclusively on federal agencies, the FBI, the Secret Service, and the CIA to do the investigation. That's not true. Uh, the commission decided early on uh, that they could not rely on the uh, uh, summary reports uh, or underlying interview materials uh, generated by the investigative agencies. They, uh, they wanted to conduct their own investigation, and the way in which that was done uh, was to bring witnesses before the commission to authorize the lawyers on the commission staff to take sworn depositions. And the end result of the commission's investigation uh, was the sworn testimony and affidavits from 552 witnesses. In other words, one got leads from the FBI or the CIA, but the testimony on which the commission relied was a testimony that it engendered through its lawyers developing a, a record on which the commission and staff could make factual findings or recommendations for the commission to consider. So that's a very important point. So the FBI 
was used by us to conduct investigative uh, uh, challenges. And in fact, they, they protested. There, at one point, uh, one of my colleagues uh, wrote and, and, and uh, rank and approved a, a five-page uh, uh, investigative request uh, to the FBI. And, and we learned 10 years later that that outraged the director because he felt he was being, he and his agency were being cross-examined by the commission that we were looking for gaps in his work. Well, that was certainly part of our effort, no doubt about it. But the most important point is that the, the FBI was well aware of Lee Harvey Oswald before the assassination. He had been interviewed three times by the FBI, twice in Fort Worth after returning as a former defector back to the United States with his wife and young daughter, and once when he moved from Texas to New Orleans and got in a public uh, a fight on the street with a, an anti-Castro uh, uh, Cuban exile, and the result was a public disturbance of this charge, and he was fined $10. And while he was being interrogated by the uh, police department, he asked for an interview by the, with the FBI. I don't quite know why he did that. Uh, but that was a third interview that, that was uh, uh, closer to the uh, eventual, to the, the assassination. That took place in the summer of 1963. They knew Oswald had gone to Mexico City uh, to visit with the Cuban consulate, the Soviet Union consulate, in order to get an in-transit visa to go through Cuba, perhaps to return to Russia, and perhaps to stay in Cuba. Uh, they knew he had, had, had corresponded with the Soviet Union embassy in Washington, D.C., after he returned from Mexico City. And they knew that his wife and children, second daughter, was born in October. Uh, they knew where his wife and children uh, were living because a uh, agent from the Dallas FBI office went to the house of Ruth Payne, where the uh, Marina Oswald and her children were living, to find out where Oswald was living. He was living separately from his wife in, in, in Dallas while the wife and children were in Irving, Texas. So the FBI was hot on the trail of trying to find out where Oswald lived. They knew that he worked at the depository. But of course, it had not yet been decided exactly where the motorcade uh, would uh, uh, traverse the, the streets of, of Dallas. In any event, they knew all this information. Uh, and when Hoover uh, appeared before uh, uh, the uh, uh, commission, he was asked, uh, didn't you not know enough about Oswald to justify referring his name to the Secret Service in advance of the motorcade. And Hoover said, absolutely not. There was no basis whatsoever for believing this man was capable of violence. And nothing in our files suggested any threat to the president. And it's absurd to think that, in fact, we had that obligation. Now, it, we learned uh, uh, 10 years later, uh, we, there was no longer a we in terms of a Warren Commission. But there was a congressional investigation you know, which uh, demonstrated that, in fact, immediately after the assassination, Hoover had conducted an internal investigation of how his agency had handled the Oswald investigation. And, and the recommendation to him was that 17 agents and officials should be disciplined for their mismanagement of the Oswald investigation. And Hoover acted immediately to discipline those 17 agents and officials, even though some of his close associates said, Mr. Director, aren't you worried that the Warren Commission might find out? And he said, we cannot defer the discipline when there's been such uh, incompetence. And, and you'd have to be insane not to have known that Oswald's name should be referred uh, uh, to the commission. That we learned 10 years later. Now what Hoover did not know when he testified uh, in May of 1964 was that the agent who had conducted the uh, interviews of Mrs. Payne and, uh, by coincidence, Marina Oswald briefly on November 1 and November 5 had gone back to his office. And 10 days later, an unsealed envelope with his name, James Hostie, on it was delivered to the receptionist at FBI. The receptionist, in the grand tradition of receptionists, opened the envelope and read the communication. And 10 years later, she swore under oath that it said something like this. This is a warning. I will blow up the police department and the FBI office if you don't stop bothering my wife. Signed, Lee Harvey Oswald. Now, Agent Hosty testified under oath 10 years later, said it was unsealed. He never read it until later. Uh, 
somewhat later, and he had a totally different recollection. And he, he, he said, well, it said something like, uh, uh, I, I, I would like you, if you want information from me, please, please consult with me. And if you have any uh, difficulties uh, uh, with this problem, please let me know so I can report this matter to the appropriate authorities, uh, unsigned. And he said he didn't know who wrote it. Uh, so uh, we have the fact that uh, uh, Agent Hosty, at least, knew that there was this uh, envelope, uh, uh, a note from, from Oswald. I don't think anyone can question that the receptionist was telling this, a story that was more accurate than, than the agent was. Uh, and he put it in his, his box, never acted on it before the assassination. And uh, the day of the assassination, when it became clear that Oswald was the suspect who'd been apprehended, uh, uh, Agent Hosty had to explain to the head of the Dallas office uh, that he had this uh, communication, and he was asked to write a memo about it to give to his superior, because they knew they were going to be asked by the director exactly what their connection had been uh, with uh, uh, Oswald in the earlier uh, weeks before the assassination. After Oswald was killed by Ruby, the director of the uh, Dallas office told Hosty to destroy the note. And it was put in, flushed down the toilet. Now, I ask you, I mean, if, I, if, if Hosty had done what we think would have been natural and to interview uh, Oswald, uh, I think there would not have been an assassination. So what would that have meant for our, so our, what, how, what this meant for our investigation actually was not really very, very important. I mean, the fact is the commission, even though the director had lied to them, felt that there was a problem with the way they'd handled the investigation. And they, they were mildly critical of the FBI's uh, uh, handling of it. The commission uh, uh, did not think that the Oswald record met the criteria of the Secret Service, but they thought that the agency knew enough they should have done more, uh, more uh, uh, with it. And they made some recommendations about improvements of presidential protection. Uh, but that, that's the FBI story. The, the CIA issue is a more important one. Before you get to that, yeah, let me ahead. just uh, comment that that evidence that the FBI uh, covered up and eventually destroyed would seem to be, looking back on it, probably some of the strongest evidence that Oswald acted alone and was not part of a conspiracy. No, I, I think that's that? a very important point. Yes, I, I, I agree with that. I think that you know, there are so many reasons why Oswald was not a, uh, shall we say, a, a viable member of a conspiracy. I mean, you simply have to just learn a little bit about uh, the, why he, he, he def his growing up when he was a very troubled kid in New York and Texas. Uh, public health authorities were already dealing with him. He had this incredibly demanding, unloving mother. He, he fled the uh, family for the Marines as soon as he could get out of the house. He, he took up with Marxism, went to the Soviet Union. When the Soviet Union wouldn't make him a citizen. He tried to commit suicide. Then he's dissatisfied. He comes home. He can't find a job or hold a job. In other words, he's unreliable. He's emotionally unstable. He would never be someone you would designate to do anything of importance. Let's, let, let's put it there. But one thing is clear that if he had any intention to assassinate the president or had been a member of a conspiracy with some, that goal in mind, he would never have written this note. I mean, so it, it is the clear, c convincing evidence that we did not have at the time uh, that our, our, our judgment was uh, confirmed that he really was not part of, an, uh, of a conspiracy. And, 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 and we, con we conducted a, a very broad investigation, both of Oswald and Ruby, looking for connections to Cuba, to the Soviet Union, to the Mafia, you know, to anti-Cuban, uh, uh, Castro uh, uh, exiles, to uh, all the teamsters, all, all the candidates for conspiracy that you have read about. We, we explored all those avenues, and I always make the point that you can talk about the Soviet Union or the Mafia or, or, or the Teamsters Union, and you can agree they, they had the means and the opportunity and the motive, but that doesn't get you very far. You still have to link that conspiratorial plan with some overt acts that reached down to Oswald or to Ruby. I mean, you all know what a conspiracy is. It's simply an agreement of two or more people to do something illegal. And you not only have to have a plan, you have to implement it, and you have to have some overt act. So in other words, our investigation showed that none of these relationships that Oswald or Ruby had tied back to any group that had any motive uh, to kill the president or to was so offended by Robert Kennedy's pursuit of the mafia 
and the Teamsters Union that it would trigger an assassination of the president. So I agree with you. I think a very important bit of evidence that is absolutely ignored, along with many other critical factors, uh, by the conspiracy community. And the CIA, what did they withhold? Well, the CIA, I, I think in retrospect that, that Alan Dulles should never have been appointed to the commission. Uh, uh, Alan Dulles was a former head of the CIA, as many of you know. Uh, he was uh, uh, in that position when the Bay of Pigs uh, adventure uh, uh, proved to be a total debacle. Uh, and of course, the military establishment and the intelligence establishment, to some extent, uh, had engineered this whole experience with 1,500 Cuban exiles in the anticipation, one, that they would, they would stimulate a, a rebellion in the native community of, of Cuba as soon as these uh, freedom-seeking uh, exiles uh, approached the island, or alternatively, that the president would unleash military forces to support uh, the, this escapade. And President Kennedy refused to do that. Uh, and, uh, and there are those who write today with some vigor that he so antagonized the military and the intelligence community by his treatment of the Bay of Pigs affair as well as his handling of the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962 that they are the prime potential conspirators in the view of some. So the CIA did not tell us about the assassination plots that had been uh, planned beginning in 1960 under the Eisenhower uh, a regime, and, and, and Dulles clearly knew about those that were uh, uh, being planned while he was director. You cannot always assume that the director knows what people in the agency are doing. Uh, I hear a laugh. Someone knows the government back there. Uh, uh, the, uh, in fact, uh, Dulles' successor, uh, John McCone, uh, said he never, he was appointed in 1961, said he never learned about Cuban assassination plots until 1963. President Johnson never learned until 1967. So in, in any event, so let's assume that Dulles knew enough, let's put it that way, that, that about this, which he did not share in any respect uh, 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 with, uh, I believe, members of the commission and certainly members of the staff. I was part of the staff that went over on more than one occasion to talk to CIA officials. The CIA officials assigned to work with the commission were very decent, very smart people. And they did not know about the assassination plots. And they testified 10 years later, 11 years before the church committee, that this was a staggering revelation to them. And if they had known that, uh, you know, they would have felt that the Warren Commission should, should have, staff should have known about it so that the investigation could be cast somewhat broader. Several of us testified about this in 1978. And I think I speak for the majority of people when I say that. We don't think it would have changed our investigation to this sense, that if we learned, for example, that the CIA was using identified people in the mafia or in the Cuban exile community, and we're discussing this kind of uh, attempt with those people, that we would want to interview them to find out whether they had relationships that might reach out to Oswald or Ruby. In other words, uh, it would extend our investigation, but our, we were basically confident in 1978 that it wouldn't have changed our results about our findings as to the absence of a conspiracy uh, because in the House Select Committee in 1977-78 issued a report in 1979. They had all this information about the assassination plots. They interviewed 50 witnesses who were present or former employees of the CIA to examine exactly what the CIA files on Oswald meant. And they were virtually unintelligible to the ordinary uh, a person, uh, and they concluded uh, uh, that there was no credible evidence of a conspiracy involving either the Soviet Union or Cuba or the Mafia or the Teamsters Union or any federal agency. Those conclusions were reached in 1978 uh, in a report in 1979. They basically confirmed all the major conclusions of the Warren Commission as to the lack of evidence regarding a conspiracy, and they did have the benefit uh, of the CIA information. Uh, so you know, I, I'm, I still didn't like being lied to. I said, I, as I said, many of the people that worked at the CIA who were at meetings that I were at did not know. But I was also dealing face to face with the deputy director, who later became director, Richard Helms, uh, who did know. And, and, and he, he testified later under oath that he was not under an obligation 
uh, to tell the uh, commission about these assassination plots uh, because one, he didn't see any relevance uh, to our investigation. Uh, uh, two, he think we probably knew on the commission and on the staff that Cuba and the United States uh, were antagonistic, so we didn't have to know uh, how uh, his agency was see trying to deal with this uh, position. And his, his bottom line position was that I did not have to volunteer information if they didn't ask me a specific question uh, I, uh, for the information, I wasn't going to provide it. Uh, I guess I was not, I was offended as most by the latter as by the former because that meant I had to ask a question about well, what, what assassination plots have you been developing recently uh, <laughs> across the table to a deputy director uh, in charge of plans at the agency. And I was young and uh, assertive, as they said, and occasionally abrasive, as it's been said. Um, but I wasn't that stupid, uh, and, and I wanted to keep the you know, relations with the CIA working people and the staff uh, on, on, on a good level. So in any event, that was Helms' final position. Helms, had, and people say, what would you have done differently, and what could you have done differently to deal with these agencies that didn't tell you the truth? Well, years later, the, the, the government, the legislature, the Congress created and passed a law uh, asking for an agency to be created to dig even further to get all those assassination records that has been withheld from the CIA and the FBI and any agency you can think of. And the only enforcement mechanism they had in that law was that the agency head, after uh, uh, the search had been conducted and the documents had been produced and deals had been negotiated, he had to certify under oath that he had conducted a full church and provided all the documents. So. Now, that was the enforcement mechanism that was chosen. That was 30 plus years after the commission. And, you know, and people who would lie to you face to face are going to lie to you in an affidavit. I mean, so you know, I, the question is you can never enforce integrity on people that work for the president, and, and even the president you know, gets lied to. So I, I don't know what you can do except try to, try to you know, establish the importance of the assignments and work diligently and cross-examine and, uh, and, and try to produce the best record that you can. But that was a frustrating experience that I don't think the subsequent years have provided any particular lesson that would be followed if the commission were created tomorrow to investigate some equally serious matter. I have more questions, but I'm going to open it up to questions from the audience at this point. We have a microphone. If you'd wait till the microphone gets to you. Oh, I have the microphone, so do I need to? <laughs> but just one more thing I want to say. That, uh, one thing I, I didn't uh, know till I read it in your book is that there was an assassination attempt on Castro scheduled for November 22nd, 1963. Yeah, that, that's absolutely right. I mean, talk about uh, coincidences <laughs> and, 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 and chance. And uh, also, by chance, there was a uh, interviewer from a French newspaper with Castro uh, uh, when the uh, assassination uh, was reported. And it was the same reporter who had interviewed uh, President Kennedy uh, in the previous week. And, and to some extent, he was sort of a messenger from Kennedy uh, uh, that uh, Kennedy uh, was looking for some way to uh, alleviate the tensions between the two uh, countries. And in fact, I learned in the course of writing this book that there was a back channel uh, uh, a program that was undertaken in March of 1963 uh, to achieve uh, some rapprochement uh, between the two countries. In any event, the reporter subsequently said that Castro was absolutely shocked by the development and immediately was concerned uh, that his government would be tr uh, triggered uh, uh, as the uh, a guilty party, and that, of course, would mean the end of his regime, if not his life. Now to questions. We'll start yeah, here. Start you want to stand up so maybe one, we can hear you? First question is, uh, you were a young lawyer at the time. Uh, on a personal note, who and how were you asked and how did you feel about being on the commission? Everybody hear that? How he got on the commission? He has another question. He also said I was a young man. <laughs> uh, was, I guess it's to the point. Uh, Yes, I was 32 years old. Uh, I've been in the Justice Department for two and a half years. I was one of two deputies to the head of the criminal division, who had been a partner in the firm that I was associated with uh, before he was asked by Bob Kennedy to join the department. Uh, 
And, uh, and, and I had some variety of responsibilities uh, as a deputy, but I did manage to get involved with some of the more sensitive matters in the division. Uh, and uh, uh, it so happened that uh, uh, Nick Katzenbach was the deputy attorney general at the time. And immediately upon the assassination, Bob Kennedy basically had family responsibilities and absented himself from the department for the most part for the next few weeks. And he also made it clear he did not want to see any of the records uh, investigative reports with respect to the assassination. Even though the reports were all uh, addressed to him, they didn't go to him. They went to the Deputy Attorney General and, and to Jack Miller, my, my boss. So I, I was privy to all these materials immediately upon, as they started coming into the department. I was asked on one occasion to re review the <laughs> FBI report and, and, and consider whether we, there ought to be a press release issued by the department or by the White House. So I was engaged in some of the early department reactions to this uh, event, along with my boss and uh, the public information officer at the time, and the deputy attorney general. So uh, when the commission was formed, it had three meetings. Uh, it was clear that we no longer had any responsibilities in the Justice Department. I mean, the FBI would continue to investigate, but there was no federal law. The commission was going to do the fact finding and make final judgments of, 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 of the culpability of Oswald, the existence of any conspiracy, and so forth. So uh, I, I, after the commission finally appointed a general counsel, they had the first meeting with their new general counsel on December uh, uh, 16, and, and Nick Katzenbach had attended all three meetings to provide some sort of liaison with the department and to help ask the commission how the department could help. Well, it turned out that I was called into my boss's office on the morning of September, de December 17th, and I, and I was told that, the, uh, that Katzenbach had volunteered my services. And those of you in the military know what that means. Uh, and so, uh, of course, I mean, you know, Jack said, you want to do it. I mean, you know, I said something, are you kidding? I mean, you know, uh, yes, I was honored. And, uh, and you know, uh, there are those who said, well, I must have been the, 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 the nearest warm body around. And that, that there's some truth to that, um, but also, uh, 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 he, he knew me enough, and I would, let's put it this way, I, I was high enough in the department so that I knew people three levels above me, uh, but I was low enough in the department so my absence wouldn't be missed. <laughs> so I, I, I was a perfect choice, a warm body, and I had those special attributes. Uh, that's, that's how I got on the commission staff. Thank you, so that's like, in terms of uh, conspiracy, I, if we if we ideas that you gave about conspiracy, I never thought about any of them. The only one I thought about was bullet that actually blew his head off. And it, I mean, all the, uh, the, the, the Bruno film showed that it, his head went back and to the left. And I don't understand how a bullet that was coming from behind would force his head to go back. But did the Warren Commission come up with Yes, yes, I certainly understand. And uh, uh, it, it is still a, 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 a repeated uh, a problem, and there are our, our books called Headshot and uh, other, other books that, that feature that point. And uh, uh, there is absolutely, that that is cited as evidence of a shot from the front. And, and that combined, the backward movement of the head, combined with some speculative, uh, innocent statements by Parkland documents, generated the thought that the wound in the throat was an entry wound. Uh, even though within 24 hours after the doctors at the Bethesda Medical Center talked to Parkland, they realized that, that there were uh, entry uh, wounds on the back uh, that hadn't been known to the Parkland Hospital. The, the movement, there is a general disbelief that the, the head didn't go forward. It's not shown uh, on the, the film. But in fact, uh, in, in 1975, CBS did a program uh, uh, on the assassination and they contracted out the, uh, the uh, Zapruder film to a California concern uh, uh, to look at the film. And, and in fact, Bugliosi reports that the, the detailed examination of slides 312 and 313 shows that, in fact, uh, the, the, the head did move forward two plus inches, and the shoulders moved forward one point inch. That's not deceptive. That, you know, I agree with you. I mean, I, I, I could look at that film a hundred times. I'd never see that. And then there is a unanimous medical view that once something you know, penetrates the, the body to that extent, there is going to be a natural uh, a slap of the headward backwards. 
But you, you're never going to persuade the, the, uh, the conspiracy theorist of that. You have to go further and say, well, where, where's the bullet that came from the front? Where, where are the fragments? And the, the uncontroverted fact is that the only bullet fragments in that car are from the two bullets that were fired from Oswald's rifle on the Six Boys Depository. You can talk to me about three, three people, a crossfire, I mean, the whole Oliver Stone business. I mean, let's get real here. Where'd the bullets go? I mean, talk about magic bullets, all these magic bullets coming at the car. One, they didn't hit anybody, but if they hit somebody, they didn't leave any fragments, they disappeared. I mean, it is really a fantasy. So, I mean, I agree. I mean, I, you know, take my word for it. The head went forward. But more importantly, <laughs> focus on the, 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 the physical evidence that's there and the fact that there is no second shooter. There was no one with a rifle ever seen on the premises. There was no fourth cartridge to, uh, on top of the three found on the sixth floor. There was no third bullet, fourth bullet, fifth bullet that hit anything in the car, Dealey Plaza or Dallas, so far as we know. Uh, and I think with the absence of a second shooter, you can talk about the head going frontwards, sidewards, and whatever. So that's where I'll end. I, the Australians did a good program, incidentally, trying to study what would have happened if the bullet came from the front of the grassy knoll. And one program I saw, I saw. hello there, uh, uh, had the, the shot would have gone through the president and, and, and hit his wife. Uh, so a anyway, more questions. Uh -huh. Mistake that the handling and the whole assassination was not doing the autopsy in Dallas by a professionally trained, experienced forensic pathologist. Uh, pathologist. Like you would have been able to trace the bullets, and I think the Lee Harvey Oswald lone gunman uh, fact would have been proven. What do you think was the biggest mistake in the handling of the whole uh, assassination? Well, I, I, I have to admit to a mistake. <laughs> uh, 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 I, I do not uh, uh, challenge the decision to move the body. I mean, I know there was a qualified uh, uh, forensic uh, guy, the, uh, the uh, Rose, uh, Rose uh, in, in Dallas, who certainly would have done a good job. Uh, but I, I, I sympathize with the Secret Service and with the President and the Mrs. Kennedy uh, on breaking Texas law uh, to uh, bring, bring that body back to Washington. Uh, we, we know why it was, uh, some have said, well, it should have gone to Walter Reed, where there was more experience in, in bullet wounds, the Army facility rather than Navy facility. But he went to the Navy facility because he'd been in the Navy. Uh, and it was not, it was not, people have ridiculed the autopsy that was conducted on, on many grounds. Uh, uh, but, you know, there, there was some talent on the team. And we know the room was too crowded. We know too many people were there. We know people said the uh, Secret Service was intruding. But the point is that they, they, they produced an autopsy report, uh, which did contain a mistake, actually, regarding the location of the, of the uh, rear shot to the, uh, uh, the skull. Uh, uh, but the, the, the big mistake, I believe, was uh, in not ensuring that the testimony that we had before the Warren Commission by the autopsy doctors was accompanied by their having access to the actual photos and x-rays when they testified. And there was a major staff effort to achieve that goal. The whole situation developed in a rather hasty uh, 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 way because the Chief Justice got uh, concerned by the fact he wasn't hearing some of the most important witnesses sooner. And so he wanted to expedite the schedule. So basically, two of my colleagues had to go interview the autopsy doctors on Friday to prepare them to appear on Monday. Uh, maybe extending into Tuesday. And, and, uh, and uh, this was Ireland Specter and Joe Ball, who was a very distinguished criminal lawyer from Los Angeles who was uh, on our staff, and he also was a close friend of the Chief Justices. And so uh, Joe Ball and Ireland Specter went to interview the three doctors and told them that they would not be able to have the uh, uh, materials with them. Uh, and, and they said, would, would it be helpful if we had some diagram uh, to display the wounds uh, to help our testimony before the commission. And uh, Ireland and Joe said, sure, that sounds reasonable. Uh, go ahead. And Ireland subsequently said that that was one of the greatest mistakes he made, and with the benefit of hindsight. 
because some of the diagrams that came in were sort of inaccurate in representing exactly where the, the wound entered from the back, and the, whether it was the back of the neck or the back of the upper shoulder. And there's, uh, I'm in an extended correspondence with one member, a very civil member of the conspiracy community, who attaches an enormous importance to whether I say back of the neck, which I used to say, but now I say the, up, the back of the upper shoulder. And, you know, but the fact is, whatever you call it, the hole's there. I mean, you know, it's only one place. Uh, and so in any event, uh, uh, that was a mistake. And, and Ireland wrote some very powerful memos to Rankin saying we really ought to get the uh, 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 materials and then uh, have a court reporter come in and have one of the doctors come back and then take a look at the materials and then say, would you, your testimony be the same now that you've reviewed the materials or would you want to change or elaborate in any regard? And the problem was that actually in the testimony uh, of the uh, first uh, uh, doctor, Dr. Humes, the, the Chief Justice actually asked the doctor, would it be helpful for you to have the autopsy photos and x-rays with you here today? And the witness said no. And, you know, and, and so Ireland had been trying to, as a good prosecutor, trying to elicit from the doctor an affirmative action that indeed he, his testimony would be better if he'd had the materials. And the Chief Justice, who was much smarter than some of my colleagues in retrospect seem to think, you know, uh, saw what Ireland was trying to do and asked the witness the question that I've just relayed. So nonetheless, what Ireland didn't know that this was still an open issue, and I raised it with uh, Katzenbach uh, uh, afterwards. And, and I said that it was, you know, it was, we needed to have uh, some further access to these m materials, uh, uh, although I did not, you know, no one anticipated the extent to which this would become the most substantial mistake that the commission made, which I think it was. And, 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 and Nick, Nick Katzenbeck said that he, he would try, and he subsequently talked to the Attorney General, and the Attorney General agreed that the Chief Justice could view the material. The Chief Justice had not seen any materials at the time of the testimony. So a custodian brought the uh, materials over to the chambers of the Chief Justice, and he reviewed them gave them back to the custodian. And he subsequently told at least Rankin, the general counsel, because I heard from Rankin that the Chief Justice said that these are so offensive that they cannot be uh, used or made public. Now, the Chief Justice had talked himself into a rather a, a, a dilemma that was un unnecessary with the benefit of hindsight. A couple of months earlier, when Marina Oswald showed up to be the first witness uh, before the commission on February 3, there was a group of reporters ready to greet the Chief Justice as he walked over from the court. And they said, Mr. Chief Justice, uh, will we be able to see her testimony? And he said, yes, but perhaps not in your lifetime. <laughs> and went on to say that he meant that some uh, materials would be classified. So the Chief Justice, would, and then we scrambled, and he and Rankin put out two sentences saying, you know, he was misunderstood, and that. Uh, all the materials that are available to the commission and testify will be made public as, with our report, which was our position and was proved to be the case. So the Chief Justice could not conceive, and we never got a chance to sell him or Rankin with the idea that you could use these materials with the witnesses, but still agree not to make the photos public. And, and it was my sense now, and reading some of the newspaper articles at the time now, uh, that the American public might have accepted that, uh, that the, the, the willingness not to put the, the gruesome photos in, in the front page of the, the National Enquirer, not to mention the New York Times or the Washington Post or the Cleveland Plain New York, um, and they, they might have brought that compromise. So the point is, and I write in the book, whatever criticism we would have gotten for withholding the photos under those conditions would have been much less severe than the criticism and, and, and ridicule that's been distributed in our direction because we then let the witnesses see the material so they could testify more fully and, and accurately. So that's how what I, I think and is, was the end result. And, and Rankin was the only one who supported that decision when he testified before the Select Committee in 1978. Let's go to the back of the room, the back row.
Well, let, let me take the, the, the second point first. Uh, uh, the, uh, the Warren Commission did have a single volume with about 450 pages of text and several hundred pages of, of appendices. And then in November, we published 26 volumes of the sworn testimony and the exhibits. And, and it was a, a, a fantastic production job of supporting documents. Uh, the Chief Justice and the members of the Commission felt very strongly that all of its materials should be made public as quickly as possible. And when, and, and I learned shortly before the Commission uh, concluded its work uh, by conversations with the National Archives personnel, that the National Archives didn't care one hoot what the Warren Commission wanted. They were going to follow their general standards, which was not to produce a, investigative reports of any kind without the agreement of the investigative agency, like the FBI, producing the material. And I reported that to the chief, to Rankin, and uh, the chief justice was aware of that. And in fact, uh, a few months after the report came out, someone complained to either to the White, to the White House, I think, that the uh, supporting materials of the Warren Commission, you know, that were not published, the investigative materials, internal memos, and things of that kind, uh, were not being made public by archives, and the president and the chief justice talked, and the chief justice said, that's not what we, we want our stuff to be made public. And the uh, president, uh, Johnson, issued a special directive to the archives to start processing all the commission materials. So by the time the JFK film came out in 1991, 98% of our materials were in the public domain. 2% were withheld. The House Select Committee, which completed its work in 1979, had all of its materials under the protection of a House of Representatives rule, which held that they would not become public for either 50 or 75 years. So it was those materials, which were principally the subject of the new law in 1992, that required those materials to be processed and be put into the uh, 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 archives for public availability. Now, that law provided that when all the efforts of the Assassination Records Review Board was done, and they, they finished their work in 1998, and, and they produced, they ended up producing tens of additional documents. I mean, they increased in a very substantial way uh, the, uh, uh, to the now four million documents available at the archives. But you're right with your date. The, the law said that any documents that are still classified after the uh, Assassination Records Review Board completed its work, have to be released in 2017, unless the President of the United States decides that the national interest in protecting the secrecy of the document outweighs the public benefits of making it public. So I, I've heard the figure about 2,000 documents, something of that magnitude. There's a lot of speculation as to what's there, whether they're the, it's, you know, the, the hidden secret of the second shooter or the conspiracy of, you know, the CIA or who knows whom. Um, but in any event, there it is. And of course, my view is on the document side is that certain people are never going to be satisfied. Even if all 2,000 were released, they're going to maintain, well, that's all well and good, but the most valuable documents were destroyed years ago or whatever. So now to get to your other point, you obviously read a summary of James Reston Jr.'s book called Accidental Victim. I appeared on a panel with Mr. Reston uh, down in Miami a weekend or so ago. Uh, we have a cool relationship, uh, but he, he, he's a professional author. He turns out a book a year or so. He, he first aired this theory about 25 years ago and resurrected it uh, along with the fact that he's the only living reporter who's actually viewed the girdle that President uh, uh, Kennedy was wearing that day. And it's the girdle, you know, that kept the president reasonably erect, albeit leaning toward his wife, which resulted in his being the only target available for Lee Harvey Oswald, because Connolly was submerged, crunched down in his seat, wounded. And Oswald pulled the trigger to kill the president with the fatal shot. Now, Reston has some mystical explanation for that. I never quite understood it. But the basic is he was wrong in so many regards, and your summary is accurate of all his mistakes. Uh, and let me just point out one. Uh, Marina Oswald testified at the very last uh, appearance before the commission. She said, yes, uh, perhaps my husband was, was uh, aiming at, at, at Connolly. And then she went on, and, and that's the segment that Reston picks up. 
The very next sentence is, but I don't understand that because Lee said that uh, he's going to vote for Connolly for governor when he gets back to Texas. Texas. Os Oswald's brother, Robert, was outside the interrogation room on the very day of the assassination, and a reporter came to him and said, is it possible that your brother was shooting at, at the governor because of this undesirable discharge that the Navy, the Marines gave him? And, and, and his brother, Robert, said, absolutely not. Uh, my, my brother had no uh, dislike for, for Governor Connolly. He knew that Governor Connolly not, had not issued the undesirable uh, 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 discharge, and that Governor Connolly was no longer in the position where he could review it. So in fact, Oswald said to the interrogating police department people when he was asked about Governor Connolly, he said, no, I received a very respectful letter from now Governor Connolly on this subject, saying he'd refer it to his successor, Secretary uh, Korf. So in any event, uh, and Marina, five years later, when all this information was made available to her, changed her mind. So th there's nothing there. Uh, and, and of course, Governor Connolly, uh, uh, as you know, was bigger than life. He's the guy who insisted he wanted to have his own bullet. He didn't want to share a bullet uh, with, the, with the president. So he testified against the single bullet theory and uh, had sufficient influence to persuade two or three members of the commission to weasel on their final conclusion so as not to personally offend the governor, which might have offended the president, which might have offended the public, in Texas at least. So in any event, uh, uh, Governor Connolly said, listen, if Oswald wanted to shoot me, I'm on the streets every day in Dallas without a presidential uh, entourage uh, providing protection. Thank you. And it would end, as Bugliosi says, uh, uh, a guy with Oswald's goal of historic stature that comes from killing a president who, you know, would have been fired down the line to kill, kill just a mere governor. A couple more questions. Uh, over here. Yes. Yeah. Um, I heard that when Oswald was in custody, they gave him a test to see if he fired a rifle, and it showed that he did not fire a rifle. I was wondering if that was true, and if it could actually go out of trial, had he lived, would they be able to use that test in court? No, good question. If that's the paraffin test, uh, uh, and there are people, that, that the test was given uh, by, by the police, and uh, um, the, the test uh, showed uh, negative uh, on his cheek, uh, which meant to Mark Lane that he didn't do it, and it showed positive on his hand, which meant that he did do it. And, and the real point is the paraffin test had been totally discredited, uh, and, and in fact, the, the FBI told us that, in fact, they no longer relied on it for two decades before these events took, took place. And we, we addressed this, and uh, uh, the, 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 the bottom line is that the paraffin uh, test was developed for revol uh, revolvers and then not for rifles, and it, it's activated, the paraffin is activated by all kinds of other uh, chemicals, including in human urine and, 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 and kitchen detergents. And uh, so, it has no, no probative value whatsoever. And we ran the test by having actually an agent actually fire the, the, the same rifle. Uh, and, and he didn't have show the test either on his cheek or on his, uh, his hands. Uh, so it, it was seized by both the proponents of uh, Oswald's culpability and by his, his defenders. And it, it simply was ruled out both by us and by the select committee and by Bugliosi uh, that followed our investigation. What, what did it